Good morning and welcome to Fairfield First United Methodist Church. If my eyes don't deceive me, I believe this will be a record crowd for the year. Who has an announcement this morning? Well, according to the bulletin, we do have a small group meeting this afternoon. I have verified that. We also have an administrative board meeting tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock. Tuesday, we have two small group meetings, one at 2, one at 6. Wednesday, the all-important bell choir rehearsal. And on Thursday at 6 o'clock p.m., we'll have Monday, Thursday services. Does anyone else have anything to add to the announcements this morning? All righty, how about some music? <laughs> doesn't put us in the mood for worship, then, well, I don't know what would. If you would, stand up and join me this morning in the call to worship. 
Let all who seek to follow Jesus gather together for worship. Let us learn. Jesus entered Jerusalem as the Messiah with palms and cheering crowds. The palms and the praises were fleeting acts of people who wanted to rid Israel of great oppression. If you would now join me in prayer. O oh God, when the noise and the celebration of Jesus' final entrance into Jerusalem were over, you took rejection and turned it into salvation. Lord, thank you for forgiveness and eternal life. Help us to share your love in deeds and words so as to always glorify the Christ. Amen. Our opening hymn is page 278, if you're using your hymnal, 278. Hosanna, loud hosanna, the little children sing, of reading this morning is found on number 839 in your hymnal. We're doing the music? No. Okay, not the music part, just the words. The Lord is my strength and my power. The Lord has become my salvation. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has changed me to but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I might enter <coughs> through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it.
Join me now as we sing page 277, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. see this many people here in this sanctuary this morning. Anyone else? It is just a joy to be home. How about concerns that need to be shared this morning? Does anyone have a concern? really need a microphone, but, but she brought it anyway. I want to thank y'all for the prayers for my sister Kay. She came through the surgery fine, except she's back in the hospital this morning with an extremely high fever and confusion, so it's probably infection. So please continue the prayers, because I know they work. Anyone else? last couple of days and uh, God be with all those that are, are still suffering daily from COVID so um, hopefully both of those things will improve quickly. I was uh, checking, I got a Facebook message this morning. Karen Doty's husband, Stan, they both got their second shots yesterday and he's evidently had quite a severe reaction. Um, he couldn't stand. He's running a little bit of a fever. He kept trying to get up and he would, his legs just kept giving out on him. So they've contacted the doctors or a nurse at the hospital and uh, she um, just kind of wants to watch real closely of his symptoms. but. We hope that he gets really better quick and that this is just something that will soon pass. But keep your, stay, stand Doty, keep him in your prayers. Anyone else? <clears throat> I 
Thank you, Brian. Let's check this. No. We on now? Yep. Join me in prayer, and then we'll move into the Lord's Prayer. Eternal God, we adore you whose name is love, whose nature is compassion, whose presence is joy, whose word is truth, whose spirit is goodness, whose holiness is beauty, whose will is peace, whose service is perfect freedom, and in knowledge of whom grants our eternal life. Holy God, we gather in your presence filled with regret for our many failings. And though there is greatness in us and deep longing for goodness, we have often denied our better selves and refused to listen to your calling us to rise to the fullness of our humanity. Forgive us and teach us to walk in your truth and spirit. And gracious God, for those whom we have named here this morning, giving you thanks for healing and strengthening and caring for them. We ask that you would hear our prayers for those who have also been mentioned, afflicted by the storms and the future raising of waters because of the great amount of rain. Be merciful to those who suffer in body and mind, those who are in distress and who have suffered loss. Let your love surround them and care for those who are infirmed. Restore your peace to all who are deeply troubled in spirit. And then help us to faithfully follow Jesus who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We're trying something today that I've stayed away from simply because I like security. And if I don't have to push buttons, that's one less thing that sometimes could fail. So uh, we're using the mic that I am wearing as opposed to the one that I've been using up front. And uh, I also will probably, since I can't see everyone, I, before I read the scripture today, I'm just going to tell Joel, for I'm probably going to step out here into the middle. So we're kicking off the training rails and everything today. We'll see how it goes. But when I, when I was a superintendent, I, I was covering a pulpit. You know, we didn't have a pastor there, and so I was going to the church, and it was before they built a new church. And they had, you'll, you'll never believe this, but this congregation had worshipped many years. I'm not saying how many, but many years. And they had, you have the columns here on the side. They had columns that supported the back of the church and there were people who sat behind them. Now that made me nervous, you know. Uh, and so uh, I don't want anyone to feel nervous today when I step out along this line. I will try not to drop my notebook. I'll try to do things. But I, I like to be able to see people. And uh, that way, it, you know, I don't know. This will be a first because if you're wearing a mask, I can't tell if you're making faces at me or not. So the, the reality of that is, is that we're going to just simply on this occasion, on Palm Sunday, try to incorporate and be present, not only in preaching and voice, but in being visual to one another. I read to you this day from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11 from the New Revised Standard Version of the Holy Scriptures. Hear these words. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, <coughs> you will find tied there a colt that had never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing? untying this colt. And they told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches as they cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. May these words of the gospel be encouraging to you and bring new spiritual insights to you, for you are the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's try it right about here, Joel. One church had 
the tradition on Palm Sunday to gather below the sanctuary. And as they gathered below the sanctuary, they would wait until all the people who they knew were coming to church would assemble. And then the, some took palm branches, others took tambourines and other rhythm type instruments, and they marched out the side of that lower level onto the street. And then they would begin to make song and praise and music to the community. When Dr. Walter Bergman was a pastor there many years ago, he led the group out on one occasion. And as they were there and they were saying, Hosanna, and they shouting praises to God, there was a young man who lived in an apartment near the church. And on that Palm Sunday, he looked out from his window and he says, my God, you sound like a Salvation Army. And Brueggemann looked up to him and, and he said, this dates this. He said, son, we are the Salvation Army. That is the church. The church is called to be in the light and the following of Jesus Christ, to be the witnesses of God in all of life, not necessarily to carry forth and to bring palms and sing praises out in the community, but also to be able to do that on certain occasions. I'm not asking you to do that today, so just relax. The point being, though, we in our living are called to live out our confidence. Now, that, as I talked last week, it wasn't the fact that we all need to be overjoyed and almost, how, how, how do you say it, silly in how joyful we are, but that the joy fills our life and it gives us confidence in the bad times as well, the, most, the greatest times that we live. So as we come to this day on Palm Sunday, we remember Jesus entering into Jerusalem. And so let's give consideration to the people who had gathered there this day as we consider ourselves. First of all, we notice that all the people had some high hopes as they accompanied Jesus. Jesus and his 12 had started their journey days before to Jerusalem, and as they did, they did so, and they came to the precipice before looking to Jerusalem, and you could see for miles around, and they beheld the beauty of Jerusalem. And so when they moved there, the city seemed to be so peaceful. But from the vantage point of Jesus, he realized this was drawing to the end of his earthly ministry. And as they came, he said to his disciples, the hour has come. And so I, he gave instructions to go and untie the colt and to bring it forth. He gave them the assurance, the two disciples who would go on this task, they gave them the assurance that if they were asked, they need only to say, the Lord has need of the donkey. And so they went, and they did. And when they were questioned, they did as Jesus had told them. And there was no further conversation. They brought the colt to Jesus. And no sooner than they had brought this donkey to Jesus, there were crowds of people who had already begun to move towards Jesus and to assemble. Many had come to see whether or not this Jesus, who was a seemingly new leader of some new Jewish religious movement, would be present at the celebration of Passover. And they longed for what the prophets had talked about 
and the written scriptures. That there would one day come a descendant of David who would come as the chosen one, literally the Messiah, who would restore to Israel the kingdom of David. And so they had heard the stories of this Jesus of Nazareth. They had heard him about healing people, feeding multitudes, raising Lazarus from the dead. Could this be the one? Could this be the Messiah, they thought. And then, as he rode, people saw him, and he said, here he comes. And the ones who were at the front moved about so they could see more plainly. The people who were in the back of the crowd, just like people do at parades today, they lifted the children high up, set them on their shoulders, so they too could see along this one who came in the name of the Most High God. They hoped that somehow this Jesus would push out the Romans and restore to them their own government and their own way of living. But what kind of a Messiah was he? They wondered. Because there was no pomp, there was no circumstances. He did not ride a stallion, a war horse, nor was there an army that accompanied him. There was just thrones of the common people who walked and waved branches and who sung and who put their cloaks on the road before him. In Zechariah 9, 9, he said, this prophet said that the Messiah would indeed enter Jerusalem riding on a lowly donkey. But others were not put off by Jesus' entry. They, would, they had witnessed his miracles. They had witnessed him healing and feeding but there were others who were not as excited about Jesus, and we find that they were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and they felt that their authority was somehow being challenged. And so the mood was of the celebration that day, with branches and voices, those who were along the way of the entry into Jerusalem accepted this promised one with an exuberant welcome. They blessed God, and they gave thanks, and they shouted Hosanna, which means nothing else other than to save us. Save us. We can, we can, we can identify with that. We can resonate within our own souls about that because that's what we cry out to God as we enter into our relationship save us. But then we also ask God to be faithful and to help us to be faithful that we live out that salvation. The people though that day wanted someone to do more than to make a better life. They wanted someone to literally lead a revolution. The problem was there are high hopes was short-sighted. Short-sighted in the fact that they couldn't see and hear the vision that Jesus had taught from and spoke to them about. He talked with them about that God was doing something new in their midst. That God's love was to people and, and it accepted them. And that Jesus oftentimes spoke to people with the thoughts of, go and sin no more. This was something quite different than judgment and revolution. God was at work, but not in the way that many people could see. The reminder is, God, to us this day, God is always at work, even when we don't perceive God at work. 
Jesus had made his triumph entry into Jerusalem, exhilarating some, deflating others. And now it's close of the day, it's evening, and Jesus somehow goes near to the temple. He looks to the area. And soon he would retire to Bethany with his disciples outside Jerusalem. But before leaving, he did go to the temple. And he looked at it. If you allow me, I wonder with you this day of what maybe Jesus was thinking of as he surveyed the temple courts on Palm Sunday. Thinking that probably this would be his last week of life. Was he already offended by the money changers who were changing the current coins and money of the people so that they could give offerings during Passover? Was he looking at the temple in all of its greatness, the beauty of it and the marvel of the structure that had been built in its day, knowing that it too would be demolished and which was something that took place within 40 years of his own death. Did he think about the inner part of the temple in which we find that upon the day that he was crucified that the temple's curtain was torn in two? Did he think about what type of witness God would give to the people in his death? Perhaps, perhaps he thought of the betrayal and the mockery and the trial and the agony that he would experience on a cross. It's easy to shout and a parade. It's easy to shout and to celebrate salvation. It's harder to serve in that salvation. It's harder to give praise to God as we live. And so the people, like them, we also like parades. We get caught up in the excitement of the moment. We find great enthusiasm within ourselves. We find that in we draw near to an end of a project, there is a source of energy to which we can see it through. But when we can't see the end of something, or we're uncertain about something, can we still serve with the same confidence that we have that God saves? In Mark 10, we read the days prior to coming to Jerusalem that Jesus had been talking to the disciples of what was going to take place to him, that he, the Son of Man, would be delivered up to the chief priests and they and the teachers of the law, and they would condemn him to death, and he would be handed over to the Romans, the Gentiles, and he would be put to death. But that three days later, he would rise from the dead. The disciples did not want to hear such words. You think about life. We don't like to face death, even when our loved ones are there and we are with them, we still do not like to face the reality of death. So we can understand the pain that came to the disciples' heart with Jesus talking about such things. But it still did not change what Jesus was saying to them. He was calling them to consider the coming kingdom of God being among them not as they had imagined, but that it was there and Jesus had already inaugurated it. He had already brought it to existence. Jesus increasingly talked about the sacrificial service 
of even giving their life. It's easy to shop, but it's hard to serve. The people who welcomed Jesus that day in Jerusalem did not totally understand the new realm that was breaking forth into the world's history. They wanted Jesus to smash the Roman government. They wanted Jesus somehow to bring about and restore the kingdom that once belonged to David. They did not understand that God was saying to all of humanity, Jews and Gentiles alike, salvation is to you, the people. This group that did follow Jesus and did follow and experience Jesus' resurrection and followed him and learned to serve, this group of people now numbers millions. Yes, I know there's much talk about the denomination, the United Methodists, and other churches as they have shrunk in numbers. But it still does not change that where the gospel, the good news of God's love, is accepted into the hearts of people, people's lives are changed. The church continues to add numbers. We are a testament of that, are we not this day? Do we not also think of the things of which the, down through history has been accomplished in the name of Jesus Christ? The establishments of communities, not only building of churches in a community, it's helped to build that community, but also, but also the building of hospitals, of higher education, universities, things of learning, doing mission work, providing healings and other agricultural means of people being able to improve their lifestyles in foreign lands. Jesus heard the people say, Hosanna. We say today, Hosanna. But we say it not only that God save us, we say it, Hosanna, Christ lives. Christ leads us as people. And God wants us to help to establish that there's dignity to the oppressed, that everyone can experience God's peace, God's salvation, forgiveness. I ask you this day, can Jesus count on you not only to shout Hosanna, but does Jesus count on you for your voice your lifestyle, your actions to witness to the Savior. I invite you to join countless Christians that, who have lived through history and who are alive today who do say deep in their spirits, Hosanna, thanks be to God for the one who comes and gives salvation. Let not the cheering end as this service does this day, but let it go forth from with you out into your homes, into your families, into the community, so that all may be able to know that you're willing to serve the God who grants salvation to all people. Let us join together in the prayer that is in the bulletin. Pray with me. Jesus, save us. So often we have taken for granted the salvation that you gave us through the cross. Somehow we feel we are entitled to God's blessing without sharing them with others. Forgive us. Give us the courage and strength to proclaim and share your grace and love unto doubting and hopeless people. Let it be so, we pray. Amen.
Will you prepare and, and to sing the closing hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Dear ones, <coughs> brothers and sisters, this service has now concluded, but our going forth to lead the countless hosts in the celebration of the coming of the Messiah is part of our task. So as you go forth, you can sing if you wish, you can say praise, you can share greetings of grace in one another, with one another. But remember this, you go forth as the army of salvation, the salvation army, so to speak, in the name of God, go forth, grant grace and mercy to all whom you encounter, families, strangers, and in doing so, may you lift the hopes of this world to see the Christ who saves all.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.